First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a terrific conference. I congratulate VDEM. It's a, an example of how VDEM has, has really just keeps evolving and growing and, and doing fantastic things. So I salute everybody who is involved in bringing you all together. I'm gonna to undertake the radical act of speaking without a PowerPoint presentation, which, uh, uh, it's funny, in the world I live in, in Washington, people don't use PowerPoint. And I was thinking about you know, the differences in subcultures and how in the academic world it's just become something you absolutely have to do. And I was thinking, why don't, why don't we use it? I don't know. I, I mean, you could say maybe we don't have any data in the policy world. We just talk and have opinions and, you know, that's, that's one argument. I mean, another one actually I think is that, uh, it sounds funny, but uh, I think the Iraq war had something to do with it. How did the Iraq war have something to do with it? Well, PowerPoint came online as a technology right around the time that the Iraq war did in Washington. And the US military loved PowerPoint because it was a way of taking a very chaotic situation in Iraq and turning it into PowerPoint slides. And I remember sitting through a presentation on the reconstruction of the Iraqi judicial system, which had a six month time frame with a series of action items. At the end of six months, Iraq would have a fully functioning rule of law. And I remember I left with a friend and I said, I don't want to see any more PowerPoint presentations because something's wrong here with this technology and the thinking that's going into democratization. So maybe there's a deeper issue as well in my own thinking about how democracy occurs and how PowerPoint works. Okay, I have been asked to talk about lessons <clears throat> from sort of the larger democracy promotion community that might be relevant to Europe as it confronts these issues of democratic decay and recovery. It's a fairly tall order, <clears throat> and I haven't given such a talk before, so uh, let me do my best. <clears throat> I would start by saying there are two big challenges in trying to take on lessons from said democracy community for decay and recovery. The first big challenge is that this community, surprisingly, despite all it has faced in many different countries, has not really gotten very far in creating good analytic sort of insights and methods about democratic decay and recovery. Because what happened is the democratic community was built on the foundation of a belief in democratic momentum. And so the theory of change of the democracy support community was you facilitate a natural momentum that occurs as part of this sort of global wave of democracy. And you facilitate it by helping people create the institutions they want to create, like political parties, help them carry out the processes they want to carry out, like free and fair elections, build the civil society they want. So it was built on the idea of a natural momentum. And then about 10 to 15 years ago, when it became obvious that natural momentum had stalled in many places, the community was left without a theory of change. And you saw within democracy assistance organizations, they created, I remember, and they still have an analytic framework which says we are working in three kinds of countries. We're working in democratizing countries, those that still seem to have momentum. We're working in authoritarian countries, ones that are just stuck. And then we have an awkward middle category of countries that they just called either backsliding or stuck but they didn't differentiate them very much. They didn't really have a theory of change about why they were stuck or backsliding, and then therefore what you should do about it. So, <clears throat> I mean, the first thing I'm saying is, is the bad news is there isn't really a well-developed theory of decay and recovery out there in this community. On the other hand, as I'll talk about, democracy supporters have confronted many such situations, and there, are, there is actually some learning. It's just not very well organized, I would say. But that's just one challenge. There's a bigger challenge. <clears throat> the bigger challenge is that what this means is that Europe, and I'd say North America, where we also have our democratic problems, Europe and North America need to learn from a different part of the world, from the non-West or from outside of Europe. It's been hard enough, I would say, in the last five to 10 years for Western Europe to start thinking maybe it should be learning something from Central or Southeastern Europe. That's already a pretty big stretch for a lot of Europeans. Um, it's a much bigger stretch to ask Europeans, I'll just start saying Europeans rather than Europeans in North America, it's a big stretch to ask Europeans to say, can we learn lessons from Africa or the Middle East or Asia? It's really hard. Why is it so hard? <clears throat> well, there are reasons we know, but let's say them out loud. 
First, there's been the assumption that, uh, well, our democracies just work a lot better than theirs, and we have different kind. we have the, the problems of the first world, they have the problems of the third world, and those are just different kinds of problems. Well, that's changed as we face issues, and, you know, a conference like this, you know, clearly puts on the table that, you know, Europe is facing a lot of issues that are actually quite familiar to people who've worked in other parts of the world, and certainly in the United States, all of the problems we've been having uh, it's very hard for Americans now to say there's something different in kind about the kind of political leadership we have, the dysfunctionality we have in our system in many ways, and the kind of leadership and dysfunctionality we see in, the non, in many parts of the non-Western world. So that argument has gone away a bit. <clears throat> but there are still other ideas that have kept us from joining up. Uh, another is that basically, well, those countries are poorer than we are in poverty somehow makes democracy a lot more difficult, and so they may have, the problems may look similar. You have a bad political leader in the Philippines, we have a bad political leader in Washington, but we're, we're just on such different economic planes that we can't really relate. Well, that's fading too. Which country has a higher GDP per capita? Um, Malaysia or Bulgaria? Malaysia does. <clears throat> Which country has a higher GDP per capita? Uh, Hungary or Chile? Actually, Chile does. Uh, there are a lot of countries out there that are richer than countries closer to home. And moreover, <clears throat> as inequality grows in the world, um, there's a lot of poor people in rich countries, and there's a lot of rich people in poor countries, and so forth. And so the economic profile of countries around the world is getting more similar as inequality grows within countries and reduces between countries. So the idea that, well, we're just a lot richer than they are, Mm, that's kind of yesterday's, <clears throat> yesterday's reality, not today's. Another one has been an unconscious, usually unconscious assumption that, well, there are certain sort of cultural norms. You know, we're Western and they're non-Western. <clears throat> um, and that means various things to different people. You know, our religions or maybe some kind of our social practices, more about something tolerance. But A, our societies are becoming more differentiated in sociocultural terms. We have people from all kinds of uh, backgrounds and cultural traditions within our own society. So the idea that there's a thing called the Western world and non-Western world is a pretty old-fashioned idea, actually, when you think about that. Um, and uh, then the third idea that's kept us apart is people say, well, we have a lot more traditions, democratic traditions. These are new democracies. People love this term, new democracies. Um, and so they're, they're struggling with sort of setup, whereas we're struggling with readjustment, and that's, that's a different thing. But, you know, I, I was in Argentina not too long ago talking about democratic trans transitions, and I started my talk and I said, you know, we're actually here in Argentina in the 193rd year of democratic transition. Argentina's been trying to become a democracy for a very, very long time, since the 1820s. So, no, they don't have a strong tradition of established democracy, but they have an incredible legacy of experience of back and forth with democracy and non-democracy. Indonesia, the recreation of political parties in Indonesia in the 1990s was carefully sort of built upon traditions from the 1950s and greatly resembled the party structures that were built in the 40s and 50s. And Kind of sounds like the time Germany rebuilt its party structures. And so this idea that they're new, we're old, it just doesn't pan out. That's just not a reality. So if we start to cut down these barriers between the West and the non-West and realize, so what is separating us? Actually, not very much. Uh, except mental obstacles, as I'll, I'll talk about uh, later on. <clears throat> now, so if we do try to take on board experience elsewhere, What's interesting is that to the extent there's a differentiation of types of decay processes or backsliding situations, to the extent there is such a, not really, there isn't a literature, but a practical approach when I work with organizations on this, the three topics that came up a lot yesterday as core syndromes in Europe are very much the same core syndromes that people are facing in backsliding countries. Those are first, rise of illiberalism, <sighs> The second is polarization and rise of severe polarization, or what Jennifer McGoy calls pernicious, pernicious polarization. And then third, state capture, debilitating state capture. What's striking to me listening yesterday, starting with Anna's presentation, but then throughout the day, is in Europe, 
people are thinking these three things inevitably go together, where you have an illiberal turn, it tends to polarize, you get state capture, and they're treating this as a kind of unified syndrome. And it's because it's kind of new in Europe to confront these things. It's like a, a jumbled mess in the middle. And you say, wow, there's a lot of bad things and all bad things are going together. That's not the experience out there in the world. All three of these are very relevant, but they're happening in much uh, more, I would say, complicated and varied ways, and they're often happening separately from each other. So what I wanna go through is each of these three syndromes, talk about how it's more varied than it is in Europe, but then I wanna go through each one and talk about there are some experiences with each one of both how you confront it as it's happening and how you try to get beyond it when, when the, bad, the bad news seems to turn. So <clears throat> looking at rise of illiberalism, uh, here in Europe, of course, the focus is on uh, illiberalism from the right, but out there in the world, the rise of illiberalism is a very mixed picture. You have an illiberal turn in Latin America in the last 20 years towards leftist governments that uh, use illiberal practices to carry out populist agendas. Venezuela is kind of the archetypical case, but there, there are others. So you have kind of illiberalism that's associated with, with kind of left projects. You do also have illiberalism associated with right-wing type projects. So the Philippines is an example of an illiberal leader, very security focused. It's very much a law and order kind of illiberal agenda. It's a bit more, it's different from what you have in say Hungary or Poland, but it sounds a bit more like it. Uh, but then you also have illiberalism without an ideological project. If you look in Tanzania these days, you have a leader who's taking the country backward into illiberalism. There isn't an ideological project, it's, it's, a, it's a thug project. It's not an ideology project. It's a, I'm gonna squeeze the life out of this political system because I can. And so illiberalism is a lot more varied and this, you know, we have to be careful in Europe not to slip into this idea when we start talking about illiberalism, an assumption that that's something that, quote, comes from the right, it comes from human beings who, who use it for different purposes and different projects. <clears throat> in addition, out there in the world, you have a lot more variance in severity and pattern. You still have, although... Uh, you do have the pattern of the gradual suffocation of liberalism through sort of slicing tactics bit by bit. You still have old-fashioned smashing it uh, with the military or very harsh means like in Egypt in 2013 where you had a brief pluralizing, liberalizing period smashed by an anti-liberal military that has crushed that project and is, is grinding it into fine powder. And so you have much greater variation or you have countries going from some suffocation to full suffocation, like Cambodia, which has been living in a semi-authoritarian state for quite a while, but for in the last two years, the leadership has been squeezing the life out of what little uh, space was left in the country. So <clears throat> my first point on illiberal drift is that it's actually, there's a quite an array of illiberal drift out there. Drift isn't even the right word. <laughs> illiberal movement that's much more varied, much more complex, and so therefore actually a lot can be learned from it. That's also kind of similar with polarization. Uh, Jennifer McCoy started her presentation yesterday by saying something very important is that all populists are polarizing. Their projects are very polarizing, but not all polarization are populists or as a result of populists. Whereas in Europe, we tend to associate the word polarization with populists and it's part of that illiberal right drift. Whereas out there in the world, the important work Jennifer and her colleagues have been doing, highlighting cases of polarization in the world, a book that I also did on a similar topic, we see lots of cases where polarization is not the result of a populist project. So like in Kenya, for example, you have polarization between two important tribes, a formative rift in the terms that Jennifer and her colleagues used that when <coughs> Kenya was established as a modern state, the two tribes immediately began to try to carve up power between them. And ever since then, Kenyan politics has been a tit-for-tat battle. It's highly polarizing between the two sides. Some episodes of stepping away from it, as I'll talk about. And that's different. <clears throat> or Bangladesh, very polarized democracy, which has descended into something much worse. But again, the two sides, it was very much a tit-for-tat process. It was not a project of polarizing populists coming in and driving it. Instead, it was two sides that began to fall into a very negative pattern of political behavior and continue to up the stakes and misbehave and break norms and so forth. So polarization 
has a much wider range of experiences out there. And as Europe starts to say the word out loud, to think about it, and the valuable work, for example, more in common is doing to study polarization in Europe and actually chart it, uh, there's a lot there that can be learned. And then the same is with state capture. State capture is a very complicated term. Someone usefully yesterday highlighted that you can kind of look at it as two types. You can either have business captures the state, and they pointed the Czech Republic as an example where important Czech business people had gotten a hand into the state in certain ways, or it can be that a party captures the state and then captures business, which is more the Hungarian model of state capture. And we use the term state capture a bit loosely to refer to different things. Well, the good news analytically is the world out there is a festival of state capture and lots to study and lots to learn. Uh, state capture is, is a primary method of political rule in most parts of the world. Uh, there's whole sort of books written on the patrimonial state in Africa as the dominant form of African politics in the modern era. And so treating state capture as a kind of an exceptional thing that happens to countries, uh, well, uh, there's a big world out there and there's a lot of experiences I'll talk about in dealing with it. And the important thing to note is again, state capture here is being associated with the illiberal turn. In a lot of countries, state capture is completely compatible with pluralism. Um, <clears throat> South Africa, for example, very pluralistic country, free and fair elections, a lot of space for, for you know, all of the basic political and civil rights, yet descended down a road of very bad state capture in the last 10 years. Similarly, Brazil, throughout the years, the last 20 years before Bolsonaro, uh, Brazil had a lot of state capture. The political elite in the country really gotten its hands into the business community and vice versa in some very nasty ways completely compatible with Brazilian pluralism and democracy. And so state, the idea that state capture is something that only happens after you have the liberalism. No, no, state capture can be a very, you know, an integral part of democratic politics. South Korea is another example for a while. So <clears throat> let's go back through these three. Like what I'm trying to emphasize is that European analysts are telescoping these three syndromes into one cluster, but when we take them apart, that's the only way to start pursuing insights and look and say, so are there some experiences that we could draw from? Now, as always, there aren't, <clears throat> as I do that, there are never like simple lessons you can lift up and say, gee, you know, we'll just do it exactly like here and take it over here. But nevertheless, if you identify the right kinds of cases, there's a lot worth studying. And I've seen very little work here in Europe or North America trying to study what I'll mention is what I think of some of the interesting cases where there is actual learning to be generated <clears throat> or to, to be gained. The first, on illiberalism, of course, um, there's, a, as I said, a tremendous experience with it. I mean, I, first I'd offer a couple of general conclusions. Um, the first is that what's really been striking in the last 10 to 15 years is that as leaders become illiberal, they don't fear opposition politics. What they fear is civic activists because they make, they enter into cozy relationships with opposition or sort of co-enabling relationships with weak opposition parties that are unable to really challenge them but live in the remaining space. And what really scares them are civic activists. And so most illiberal leaders, the reason we're having the closing space for civil society around the world is because that's who they know is their real threat. What President Putin fears is not waking up one day and opening the shutters in the Kremlin and looking out and seeing an opposition party march, really, although Navalny is a hybrid of civic activism and political party. What he really fears is seeing 20 or 30,000 Russians standing out there saying, we're not going home until there's change. That's frightening to a leader. Opposition parties, not frightening to leaders for the most part. They know how to deal with them. And so, <clears throat> um, it's crucial to see that that's, that's the dynamic in many countries and that civic activism has been most, civic activism has been most effective against such leaders when it does one or more of the following things. First, when it focuses hard on corruption. Corruption is the Achilles heel of most illiberal leaders. Corruption has brought down more leaders in the world in the last ten, five years than any other single political dynamic, public anger over corruption. So when civic activism gets organized, pushes on the corruption theme, that's really been the most effective means. Guatemala is an example. It didn't work out very well, but Guatemalan civic activists together with some international institutions pushed a government that people thought was and pushed the president out of power uh, to, to, to the surprise of many people. The second is when civic activism focuses hard 
on particular junctures or thresholds. So why did the Bolivian president resign two days ago? Because he tried to extend his term past what people knew in the country. We had a constitution, you know, he amended it kind of illegitimately, and then even after having amended, he violated it again, and he violated the electoral sort of behavior, and that threshold, to the surprise of many, pushed out a leader that people thought was deeply entrenched in Bolivia. Uh, it's, it's the thresholds and the limits that push out the liberal leaders. It's not in the middle of the term, they're behaving badly, and people say this is just really terrible. It's focusing activism, what are the junctures and thresholds that these leaders need to cross? So in Uganda, for example, the Ugandan activist community has been very focused on the effort of the Ugandan president to sort of cross constitutional thresholds, and that's been an issue throughout Africa as African leaders walk across constitutional limits to extend their terms. That's the focal point. So you can either focus on corruption, on limits and thresholds, and then the big challenge is connecting the elites and the grassroots within civic activism. Uh, and so in Sudan, for example, part of the reason Sudan has surprised the international community, nobody saw democratic change coming in Sudan, was you had the outburst of public anger, which quickly got connected to the Sudan Professional Association, which is a fairly sophisticated civic group with a lot of credibility because it's sort of professionals in the society, doctors, lawyers, accountants, insurance people. And they connected the grassroots very quickly to a well-organized kind of reform type coalition and were very effective working together. And so, so there are patterns in challenging illiberalism that can be drawn upon and learned from. And then the experience of recovering, okay, actually managed to drive out the liberal leader or he or she leaves office before their time, then what do you do? <clears throat> I mean, there, I've had some conversations with Hungarians and I said, let's just have a thought experiment. Imagine Fidesz loses power. What do you do tomorrow? Um, what's the agenda? And people say, I can't get there psychologically. I don't know, uh, I'm not ready to even think about it. I said, well, think about it now, because you never know. And plus it takes a while to prepare. So where should they go to learn? Well, there are a lot of interesting examples. One is Argentina. <clears throat> the Kirchners ran Argentina as a kind of populist playground for a number of years, um, uh, <clears throat> running some fairly ruinous economic policies and, and some deep corruption, but they actually lost power. The other party came in. Well, the experience of Macri, the man who replaced the Kirchners as president of Argentina, it's worth studying. It's a serious, he's a serious guy. It was a serious effort to reform a system that had been compromised for about 10 years by a group of fairly chaotic populists. And, you know, a couple of things stand out. He had prepared a very targeted, well-designed set of measures that were fairly technocratic and therefore not perceived as polarizing. He tried to do genuine judicial reform to reverse a lot of corruption of judicial independence. He did some very technocratic but well-designed electoral reforms. <clears throat> he focused on things like the returning independence to the statistics office. The previous government had compromised the statistics office because it's unpleasant to publish statistics when you're in economic decline. So he returned independence to the statistics office. Not a very glamorous thing to do, but a very worthwhile thing to do if you're trying to rebuild some state capacity. And he depoliticized the state media and actually set up some safeguards and some councils and way of organizing media. So he actually had a coherent deliberalization agenda that was not a partisan agenda. It was a de it was a de-illiberalism, sorry, de-illiberalism agenda. And it's worth studying what was in it and what not. Not that it should be a model, but how did they think about it? How did they do it? Who did it? How did they build allies and so forth? But then the second lesson from Argentina is less pleasant, is that, as you've noticed, uh, Macri just lost an election, uh, despite doing that and despite thinking it through very carefully, because the unpleasant lesson is you get very little political credit for doing that. That's not really why people voted for you. They say that when, you know, when public opinion polls were tired of all this parentis, this and that. But when you come into office, you've got to deliver the economic goods. He got voted out of power because he was handed an economic mess. He tried to clean it up with fairly traditional market corrective mechanisms, and this tends to happen. A lot of austerity, a lot of public pain. He got caught at a different, difficult international moment for various reasons. And despite having done a lot of good things to, to improve the liberality of the political system, he paid a very high political price. And he was surprised, sort of, to some extent, I'm friends with some of the people who are his advisors, that, you know, I did a lot of good things for this country. I'm getting no credit for it. 
Sorry, that's politics. So, you know, get ready for that. Same in Ecuador. Lenin Moreno came into power after a very illiberal predecessor. He did some very good things to step back. He's now living 150 miles outside the capital, having been chased out of the capital by people angry over the economic situation. Again, he got very little credit. So you need to do those things, but you also need to do the other things that are going to get you the political credit you need. And don't think just being a good liberal Democrat and returning the country to that is going to make people love you. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Second, <clears throat> polarization. Unfortunately here, I wish, I haven't had a chance to talk as much as I hope to to Jennifer here at this conference, but there's not as many good examples of countries coming out of pernicious polarization as we might wish. People ask me that a lot, having done this book, they say, what's the answer, what's the answer? Um, how do we do it? In the United States, we're in a sort of frantic state about polarization these days, where it's like consumed by this, this polarization. Uh, it's actually a 60-year story, at least in the United States, but it's, it's like a fever burning on people's brains these days. There aren't good answers from abroad, but there are nevertheless cases that are worth studying. So for example, Kenya in the late 2000s, as I mentioned, a very polarized country, had, had entered into a very intense polarizing election in 2007 that had turned very violent and had startled both Kenyans and the international actors in the community by the, the level of violence. So people are like, oh my God, what's happening to our country? Uh, and after that election, they actually attempted for the next two or three years something like a comprehensive depolarization program in a country. It's worth studying and thinking about how did they do? Well, the basis of their program was, in terms of the actors, was a large civic coalition. Kenya has fairly sophisticated civil society and it has a large coalition that brings together labor and some religious groups and, and sort of traditional human rights actors. They had a large coalition that pushed for this. They worked within the different parties and said, this is destructive of both parties. This is symmetric polarization. Everybody could benefit by doing better. People are being killed on both sides. We need to stop this. You had the international community actually stepping in and saying, we would like to help stop this, and how could we be helpful, and so forth. So they designed a constitutional reform that was actually designed to decentralize power to, uh, I was on a forum with a Kenyan colleague a couple of days ago in the Netherlands, and she said, she was describing this process, she says, we decided to shrink the national cake so politicians would have less to eat. Uh, it was a nice way of putting it. Um, and so she said, we tried to decentralize power in order to reduce, in a sense, the, pow the powerful dynamic of chasing after the golden state. So they pushed power down. They also had commissions on reducing extremism. They had commissions on safeguards about ethnic conflict. You know, they really actually thought through what had happened to their country and designed a process to try to do it. Was it successful? Not very, actually, because the polarizing dynamic was so deep. Um, and the country has gone back through additional cycles, although they're now in what's described as the handshake period. Uh, in Kenya, the, the two sides are getting along again. They're operating under a handshake to not try to destroy each other. And, uh, but the experiences of countries like that, we could learn from. Uh, these are countries that sophisticated civil society, serious political actors, engaged international actors. There's a lot there uh, to study. <coughs> State capture. Um, now, there are lessons here both about how you challenge state capture, and then sort of how you get out of it once there's a break in the system. Uh, how do you challenge it? Uh, there's, there's emerging a literature on what makes for effective anti-corruption, and it's getting to be fairly clear. Uh, and it, to summarize it in 20 seconds or less, the, the top-down, the anti-corruption commissions funded by the World Bank and others uh, don't work very well. What tends to work well is the citizen action that puts politicians on the spot, creates monitoring, exposes people, and so forth. And there now is starting to be a body of work on what makes anti-corruption protests effective. How do you do that? We published a paper for Carnegie, for example, called Fighting the Hydra by Sarah Chase, lessons from sort of anti-corruption protests from seven countries about how you, what do you set as your goal, a very focused, narrow goal, like in Lebanon, please take out the garbage and have garbage protests? Do you set a maximal goal, like in Guatemala, we want all politicians out, we hate everybody? What is a reasonable middle goal? How do you define it? So how do you define goals in these protests that are effective? How do you make the alliances? We're about to publish a paper on how do you build alliances between technocratic anti-corruption organizations and grassroots organizations that are motivated by anger, not by technocracy. 
And so there's a body of knowledge out there that's building on how do you challenge state capture and how do you do it effective. The South African case, there's a lot to learn here. South Africa was heading down a terrible road. Uh, but then it's like a fever that sort of, it, it went to a certain level in the patient and then it broke. What broke the fever? It was a combination of a couple of things. First, they had some terrific think tank work. They had a definitional study, a really, I mean, a foundational study by a think tank in South Africa that said, uh, we have a problem with state capture. Here it is, and here's, I can't remember, 40 or 50 pages of detail about what do we mean, what is it. And this, you know, I work at a think tank. I was envious. I was in South Africa, and I was, you know, having what Anna described the inevitable conversation with the taxi driver, and he said, you know, the problem in this country is state capture. And I was like, whoa. How do, <laughs> how do you know that? He goes, read the report. You know, read the report. And I thought, how many taxi drivers in the US are reading my reports? Not enough. Um, not many. Um, this report was really well done. It was really well marketed. Coalition of think tanks that got together to make sure it was nonpartisan. Really well researched. You know, it was an example of very hard hitting policy research. Then, uh, they connected it to an advocacy community. Uh, South Africa has a very sophisticated advocacy community who pushed on this. These are sort of the legal advocates, the rule of law people. They pushed on this. And they just kept pushing. It was a 10-year story of, of pushing the issue. Um, <clears throat> then they connected with the good parts of the judiciary. South Africa has parts of its rule of law system, its legal system that work reasonably well. They found sympathetic prosecutors and judges, and they built the case. Uh, they exposed a lot of what was happening with the Guptas, the business family that was, was at the heart of it. And then they exploited the political fragmentation in the ANC. The ANC is a big umbrella party, and there were parts of the party that were dissatisfied with Zuma and his people. And so they began to talk to them and say, you want to do something about these people. They're, they're ruining your party. And so a sophisticated state capture, anti-state capture strategy based on knowledge, advocacy, political action. There's a lot to learn here. Um, when I've worked in Slovakia or Czech Republic or Hungary with activists on state capture, we've actually brought people, you know, for people from other countries to say you could learn about how you approach these topics. So there is learning there. And then once a transition occurs, and you have, in the case of South Africa, a change of leadership, or in the case of South Korea, campaign against President Park, she was chased out of office, then there are also lessons about what do you do then. In South mm -hmm. Africa, you know, the biggest lesson is the difficulty but necessity of sustained leadership. The big issue in South Africa is can this new leader really sustain the drive to clear out uh, the bad things because there's all the opaque alliances and the debts that are owed to people within the ANC. And so how do you shine a light on what's happening, the deals that are being made, and keep the pressure on the president himself uh, to make those decisions? But in South Korea, a lot of good things were done. Once Park was chased out, the other party came in, but they, again, they pursued a program of reform of the intelligence services, reform of the prosecutorial services. They got at the key institutions that were behind the state capture, exposed it, reformed it. So progress can be made on these things. So that's a bit about <clears throat> liberalism, polarization, state capture. I want to finish just by returning to the general theme here which is that <clears throat> there's a very rich domain of comparative experience, but it's very hard to reach and to incorporate. And that's the challenge before us. Why is it hard? I talked about some of the psychological barriers, but there's a basic institutional barrier, which is you have in the United States and Europe, a lot of great pro-democracy activists now working on their own countries. We heard some terrific presentations earlier by people doing that, and there's lots of those people in the US as well. Those people don't have access to the knowledge that I've been describing. It's, it's, it's not their jobs, kind of. They're, they're there, you know, trying to work with kids in sports stadiums. How are they going to know about whether South Africa is relevant or not to their experience? And then you have another community of people, which are the democracy promotion organizations, which are focused on the world out there, and most of them are not allowed to work on the world at home. You know, and so you have this puzzling situation where these people could use the knowledge, these people have the knowledge to some degree, and actually are not allowed to turn their attention in most cases very much at home because they've been designed to project outward. So we need to overcome that. <clears throat> we need to help think about that, sort of why, how can that gap <clears throat> be overcome? What are the kinds of not necessarily new institutions, but channels that can be built or reserves of knowledge or forms of connecting people? Uh, because there's a lot that could be done here. I've seen a few examples. Um, I mean, one at Carnegie in September, uh, 
we organized a workshop on political violence in the United States, because we have a problem with political violence, rising political violence in the United States. And we brought, for example, two of the leading experts from the State Department who've worked on rising violence, uh, violence reduction in Africa. And we put them there and we said, okay, suppose we're in another country. It's your job to reduce, you know, how do you view us and what would you do? And it was good for them. It was a crowd of mostly anti-violence activists. And they started by saying, we'd be very worried. You know, let me go through our typical assessment framework. You check every box. You have a leader who's broadcasting violent messages. You're already highly polarized. You have a lot of guns in this. You know, they said, we'd do a lot in this country if we were allowed to. But we're the State Department. We work out in Sudan. We don't work here in the United States. Um, so we brought, <clears throat> tried to connect these communities directly in the same room and said, let's talk to each other. Let's see if we can find ways to work together. Uh, there's a lot that can be done there. <clears throat> so I was at an organization last week, IREX, a very good non-governmental organization, does a lot of different kinds of good things abroad, but they're doing a lot of work on media literacy to overcome disinformation and negative messaging in the media. They have a big program in Ukraine, 650 different schools, working with kids to help educate them and how you become literate about understanding online that. And they're taking lessons from that back to the United States and doing a program in the United States on media literacy, drawing from what they've learned in a country on the front lines of dis disinformation wars. And so this can be done bit by bit, <coughs> initiative by initiative, issue by issue, but we have to do it. It's not gonna happen by itself. We have to think about how do we renovate democracy promotion, which is a sort of bigger preoccupation of mine. The overall field of democracy promotion is at a big turning point. And one of the ways to renovate it, <clears throat> to show its relevance to skeptical publics who are tired of funding it, is to show that it can be useful to ourselves. So I'm taking that on a bit as a mission myself, but I'm trying to encourage others to think concretely about that. So for that reason, I welcome the opportunity to speak on this topic put this together and hope it's been useful to you. Look forward to your comments and questions. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks a lot uh, for this really inspiring talk. Uh, we now have 15 minutes for questions, uh, comments and, and answers. Uh, we use the tool Slido again, so join the conversation at slido.com uh, ha with the hashtag uh, BDC2019. As yesterday, you can vote up questions and comments. And in this 15-minute sessions, I will only stick to the questions and comments posted on Slido. So uh, please uh, uh, go there if you want to uh, contribute. Let me maybe start us off with one question. So you, you made the, the very um, accurate observation that often to mobilize citizens against illiberal rulers, uh, protests and activism is framed around the theme of corruption mm -hmm. and, and not so much about actually the illiberalism of those rulers or that the measures harm democracy. And that was really something that was brought up a lot in the workshops uh, yesterday, uh, particularly by uh, the presentation by Sutan, uh, for example, that actually um, citizens might first of all have a different understanding of what democracy is, mm. and second of all also um, prioritize their own policy preferences over actually sustaining democratic norms and institutions. So do you have an example of, of a case where actually uh, in recent years um, civil society actors succeeded in mobilizing really mainly around uh, a, a pro-democratic mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. force? When you look at the rise of protests in the last 10 years, and, and by most studies you can see there is a fairly significant rise occurring in large-scale protests, they have three different bases. There's a kind of iron triangle of, of protest uh, impetus in the world. The first is inequality and injustice. People are angry about their, their basic living situation and the sense of unfairness vis-a-vis -vis others. Uh, think of Lebanon, for example, or Chile. Uh, you have Secondly, a lot of people who are angry about corruption more specifically, not just I don't have enough to eat, but I have specific concerns about corruption. Sometimes corruption is kind of a metaphor for the wrongs of the ruling class, but sometimes it's based on real knowledge. Like in Tunisia in 2010, people knew Ben Ali and his family were very corrupt and they were very angry about it. Uh, and then third, you have either political overreach or, or it's, it's for want of a better term, the fourth term that you shouldn't be doing, 
squeezing the Hong Kong governor and not letting them rule as independently as people thought. The promise was various kinds of political overreach that caused a reaction. And many protests reflect one of all three, some mix of those three different impetuses. Now, it's, <clears throat> um, let me contrast two experiences of protest and attempted reform. And it came, I was in a meeting we did in Tunisia last year where we brought some activists from the Arab world together with some activists from Ukraine and other parts of Eastern Europe. And we had a really interesting discussion. We had some Egyptians who'd been involved in the Tahrir Square movement and had been that, and they said, you know, okay, let's study why we did so badly as a protest movement, because this was a failed translation of protest energy into a positive process of political reform. And one of the biggest, you know, things they were missing was their inability to translate the protest energy into a coherent reform platform. Uh, and it was both because the Egyptian sort of reformist NGO sector was very weak because of a repressive government. There wasn't very much to connect to. And it was also due to some personalities involved in various things. Then we had on the other hand uh, Ukrainian, some Ukrainian activists who said that after Maidan, fairly quickly in Ukraine, there, there formed a reform coalition of NGOs representing quite a few NGOs across a range of issue areas from anti-corruption to pension reform to treatment of women and other things who said, okay, we're gonna translate this protest energy into a reform package and program. Now, of course, reform in Ukraine's hard. There's a lot of resistance in it. But the contrast between those two was really striking. And so you had two protests that were born out of similar kinds of energy. One was much more effective than the other in becoming a genuine sort of pro-democratic reform that has had at least some positive effects. Okay, great, thanks. So we have the first questions coming in via slide. I will take the, the top one that three people wanted to know. Uh, so you did not mention a religious extremist as examples of illiberal actors in the world. Why? Do you think it's not a problem or is it just a sensitive topic? Uh, it's important and it's sensitive, absolutely. So let's talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> I like talking about uh, sensitive things. That's, um, so, uh, First of all, the word, word extremist is sensitive. Is uh, Pre uh, Prime Minister Modi an extremist? Depends who you ask. Um, it's a touchy word, extremist. Uh, is the Hindu nationalist movement in India an extreme movement? It didn't start as one. Seems to be showing some tendencies in that regard. So yes, <clears throat> the rise of religious movements in a number of countries, identity-based movements oriented around religion, for example there, or the AKP in Turkey, or in Indonesia you see Islamists asserting themselves in political life more in kind of Islamist ways in the sense of making that essential to their cause. Uh, you see it in Poland with you know the peace and its use of religion or its relationship to organized religion. <clears throat> so religion for various reasons is rising. We have a whole different conference on why is religion in the 21st century rising in salience in many countries. Uh, it is, and that's causing fissures within religions between more fundamentalist rather than extreme, I would say, and more uh, secular sort of visions of how religion should play a role in politics, and that's polarizing countries and it's causing conflict, so indeed. But you have to be careful to say, you know, a religious fundamentalist is an extremist or an illiberal. They're not necessarily, but that project could become one uh, if it's pursued in certain ways. It depends on their view of, I want to practice my religion in a very fundamental way, but do I insist that other people do so? And, you know, it depends on what the project is. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, the other question is, uh, what if uh, civic activism is not enough, for example, in Hong Kong? Uh, often it isn't. <laughs> There's a lot of bad governments out there doing terrible things to their people. Uh, I work, worked a lot in Egypt, and it's a tragic case of activism wasn't enough. I say the government, the military government has smashed it and has crushed it, and it's been brutal, it's been horrible, and it's not enough. And nobody else is helping much either. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, what if it's not enough? Well, you live through a tragic period of repression and you hope uh, enough power emerges at some point to make it enough. Uh, but Hong Kong versus China, that's tough. Yes, uh, and bad things are coming. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but in uh, Europe, uh, we have an additional actor. We have the EU. Um, so what lessons are there from elsewhere mm -hmm. regarding the influence and role of such international actors? Yeah, well, that's, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
let me contrast two different cases here. I mean, there's a lot of general, a lot of lessons, but the international community has to be really careful not to opt for its traditional preference for stability and instead to really think seriously about change. The two cases, I, I could, the many cases, Egypt could be one, but Bangladesh in the late 2000s when the military interrupted political life saying that it was going to depolarize the country and just run a caretaker government for a while. There's a lot of donors, a lot of international actors in Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, they have a fair amount of power because it's a very aid-dependent country in certain ways. And they basically didn't contest the military's project and they sort of privately behind doors sort of said, yeah, actually maybe a bit of military discipline would be good for this country. Um, they didn't say it out loud, but they didn't really challenge the military's approach and that military caretaker government created other political problems. In contrast, in Kenya, as I mentioned, when the donor community woke up after 2007 and said, wow, we have a bigger problem on our hands than we thought, they actually took seriously. There were some great British that had funded some research on electoral violence and causes of it and creating predictive instruments for to sort of analyze when electoral violence tends to appear. They took, that, they took the analytic challenge seriously. They translated it into energy. So the international community often has a preference for stability or avoidance of hard problems, but sometimes at least when they stare them in the face, they, they react better. Yeah, indeed. And, and one, of, one of the ways international actors could help is to help to develop uh, fruitful protests against illiberal leaders. But how could that work when actually the political alternatives um, have lost uh, appeal to the public? I think that's one of the issues that we've been discussing with regarding to yeah. Hungary, for example. Yeah. Well, here we differentiate between the role of outsiders and insiders. For the most part, it's not the, the, it shouldn't be the business of international actors to sort of foment protest in other countries. Now, it can foment civic education, better informed citizens, more information about the realities of how power is exercised in the country and many other ingredients that might lead citizens to decide to take action of different types. Internal actors need to decide you know, when they, when they go to protest and when they don't and how they do that. Um, but <clears throat> protest, when, when political alternatives have lost appeal, well then the protests are the start of creating new political alternatives. I mean, that's then the protests, and we see that in you know, many places where protest movements have turned into sort of either transformed existing parties or made new parties. And we see bits of that in Europe, you know, in Spain with the creation of new parties and new, new alternatives that came out of civic activist projects in yeah. some sense. I think it's also what you mentioned in, the, in your talk, no? that, mm. that, that Putin is more afraid of, mm. of uh, civic protest than of mm. the existing opposition parties. Uh, so yeah, that, that yeah Navalny is not a conventional opposition party. He's, yeah. a, he's a protest person. He's an anti-corruption activist who has a protest following that then starts to have the character of a political party because they think their next step may be to try to win some offices. Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's challenging. That was yeah. probably the step that failed right. in Egypt. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, but uh, another uh, question that's on the mind of 10 people here uh, is uh, what actually if the civic action aims for the support of um, uh, illiberal politics or when it supports mm -hmm. illiberal politics? Yeah, uh, we did a report last year at Carnegie called The Mobilization of Conservative Civil Society, which you might want to take a look at. It was the first, one of the tricks in the research business is do a study on a topic nobody else has written about, then you have the best study available. So I can tell you it's the, it's the best study available to this topic. It's also the worst study available to the topic, but it's, it's what you got. So what we saw was that in many countries, the, quote, you know, international community has been working with a, a fairly familiar group of, quote, civil society actors, and in the last 10 to 20 years, there are rising alternative civic groups uh, or movements or social, you know, movements of one type or another that are different, that are not part of that community. And we tried very hard in the report to say the fact that they're conservative, you know, if you're an anti-abortion activist, does that mean you're illiberal? And you can get into philosophical debates about them depends on how you define liberalism, you know, but if you're an anti-abortion activist and you want to work within the framework of a democratic system and say, I'm not challenging the basic democratic institutions, I just have a different view about uh, this policy issue. We tried to say that conservative activism, we're not saying it's a bad thing, we're saying it sometimes diverges into illiberalism just as sometimes you know, uh, liberal activists in the 1970s. There were fringe movements that were more violent and were terrorist groups. So 
it can become illiberal, or some of them are illiberal from the start, but there is a world of, of alternative sort of movements and groups that we as an international community haven't known very well, we haven't talked to them very much. Um, and like in India, the, the growth of the Hindu nationalist movement was something that took place outside the bounds of the traditional donor community in India that worked with Indian civic activists. It was not, people didn't go get to know them, they didn't go to their meetings, they didn't partner with them. It just was sort of, well, that's not our world, we don't do that. And so from the international perspective in countries where you see this happening, it's important not now that we see the power of these alternative movements and ideas, it's important to make contact with them. What if civic activism at home, you know, there's a march and there's a neo-Nazi march. Well, that's, you know, those are familiar problems in countries of how much you allow, you know, the right to demonstrate for causes that are, that are clearly illiberal or, or even illegal in various ways. And I, I can't rehearse all the debates over that because it's, it's big. But <clears throat> in general, if civic active, you know, civic action is encouraging illiberal politics, that's just a sign of the depth, that these aren't just a few leaders. They're building a social movement, and you better think hard about the grievances behind that movement and decide what is it that there's their iron triangle of, of impetuses that are pushing them to do so. Yeah, no, and then very important, because like that's what we see in, in many countries that where erosion hasn't started yet, maybe, but where we see a rise of these illiberal mm. movements. So mm. this is this, the stage uh, we're at. Uh, uh, potentially, for example, in Germany, uh, I know that you've been in Germany for a few days now. You've been mm -hmm. here also before. So a question from Marcelo. Uh, so how would you rate the, the populism and, and democratic decay uh, in uh, Germany after the latest uh, election results? You probably heard about mm. the, the Turing uh, election. Mm -hmm. do, we, do you see an ongoing trend in polarization that might deepen or, or is mm. there a limit already reached? Uh, why would there be a limit? There aren't limits in politics. You know, um, yeah, I, I live in a country, we thought we had limits too, you know, watch, watch limits be, be smashed. Um, so I'm not, these days I'm not in a mood of, of limits very much. Um, yeah, all kinds of things are possible. Uh, I was talking with Laura from Moraine Common during the break, I don't know if she's, if she's still here, and we were saying, you know, the economy in the United States in 2016 when Donald Trump came to power was pretty good, actually. The economy in Germany is pretty good. I th said to myself after Hillary Clinton lost, imagine if we had 20% unemployment, we were in a real recession. Wow. This was during a basically economically healthy period. So when you say limits, limits in the exact immediate context, but the economy, you know, if you look at the charts of financial crises, there's one every 10 to 15 years. We're kind of due for one sometime in the near, not too near future. The U.S. stock market went down 55% during the last crisis. That's a big economic hit. Um, so... I don't know what the limits are. It depends mm. on what the underlying conditions are. Mm. Okay. I thought we'd get to some silver lining here, maybe, towards the end of our conversation. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, indeed, coming from the U.S., uh, I guess, um, yeah, you see limits being crushed every day. Mm. So, um, but let's return maybe to, to one of one of your main um, points of your talk, the role of political parties. Um, eight people uh, wonder about that question. Mm. Uh, so Melis framed it uh, to say that um, you dismiss the role of political right. parties for resisting liberals, but actually they're often the ones who yeah. select leaders, right? And right. formulate and organize to push mm -hmm. back. So what's No, I didn't mean to dismiss it. I said they're less scary to leaders than civic activists. Yeah, I mean, there's the two big pieces of advice that are commonly repeated, so I'll repeat them because I think they're true. The first is, for goodness sakes, get serious about coalitions. You know, why did it take the Hungarian uh, opposition parties or parties of different types so long to get serious about an opposition coalition? It was way too late, and the process finally occurred. Uh, and then the second is, don't focus on the personalities and the egregious actions. Focus on an alternative vision of the society that speaks to the same identity concerns if possible and is a compelling vision that people can believe in. You're not going to win by just tearing down this other guy who's probably better at tweeting and better at pithy phrases and better at being destructive than you are. So put forward an alternative vision. It's, it's really striking. If you go back to the first debate between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, uh, it's worth watching on, on YouTube. Uh, because the election was lost in the first 15 minutes or so of that debate. Donald Trump just starts off with this incredible narrative of American carnage, that America is just reeling with the violence and destruction and economic decay. It was just this nightmarish vision. 
It was very sort of compelling in a way because it was, it was like a dystopian movie or something. And then went to Hillary Clinton and she had, you know, that's the moment for the counter narrative and to say, I happen to love my country and I happen to believe America's doing pretty good and it can do better by building on the good things, not by tearing it apart and criticizing it. And I stand for that. What did she say? She said, if you go to my website, you'll find some good policy prescriptions. And then she said it again. She said, my website has some good policy prescriptions. And then she and her advisors read the book Shattered about her campaign, sat around in endless meetings saying, why is it we want to run the country? What's our message? And they, why was that so difficult? It, it's a mystery to me. Mm -hmm. So get a positive, compelling, alternative vision mm -hmm. that people can believe in and don't spend your time picking at the, I mean, you need to call out the worst behaviors, but don't, right. that's not how you're going to win the election. The vision is needed. Good, that, that was almost a good closing statement, but we still have like the final, let's take maybe one final um, uh -oh. question or, or maybe uh, the last uh, two questions that, that are voted up here uh, uh, together. So one, uh, one question is, if civic activism is not enough, what are we left with? What is a hurting stalemate for the regime if civic activism doesn't do the trick? I think you mm -hmm. alluded here already you know, a bit to, to um, getting a positive message. And then uh, a final um, uh, final summary: Has liberal democracy now lost its power around the world? <laughs> yeah, you know it's funny. I <clears throat> so last year, I think last year, I published an article in Foreign Affairs called "Democracy Is Not Dying." I thought it was pretty good, actually. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, Six months later, Foreign Affairs decided to do a special edition called, Is Democracy Dying? <laughs> and I said to the editor, I guess I didn't convince you. Uh, you still need to do that. So you're not going to be convinced either. Um, yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> look, I think the 21st century, since it's the last I can generalize here, I think you know the 20th century battle of ideologies, liberal democracy wins out in the last 25 years. That's good. 21st century turns out to be the century of, of governance in which all power holders are being challenged by citizens who are more activated, uh, more informed, able to organize more, more impatient. They move at a faster pace. Everybody does. It's our lives. Governance is under fundamental challenge. And the authoritarians who seem to be doing so well, those you know, assertive Russians and those encroaching Chinese and bothersome Iranians and Saudis and such, they're all nervous too. Um, authoritarians are under a lot of stress as well. Um, the Armenian government fell. The Sudanese government fell. Malaysia is moving in a positive direction. Gambia did better. There's a lot of authoritarians that are, that are struggling as well. Um, citizens are getting harder and harder to govern. And so this is the century where all power holders are going to have to renovate systems of governance to make them more responsive, more participatory in real ways, and to solve the problem of the international economy, which has gone through its sweet period of globalization and a fair amount of growth that is producing slow to little growth in the mature economies and high levels of inequality both there and elsewhere. And unless, you know, sort of the economy produces some better solutions, you're going to have populations that are on the boil. So it isn't that liberal democracy has lost its power, it's that it's reached a state of sort of maturity in terms of citizens who've grown and are more challenging, and the underlying economic foundations that were so favorable in the last few decades are no longer that. So it isn't liberal democracy per se, it's a mix of factors that have put us in this situation. All right, so all regimes are challenged, not only liberal democracies, that's my Mm -hmm. tweetable takeaway point. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much. I think it was really, really inspiring. Uh, we will break for lunch now until 1.30 and then uh, go to the action workshops where all of you have a chance not only to communicate via Slido or sticky notes or sticky points, but really by saying something. Uh, and then uh, we will have the final closing public event at 4. Thank you. Thank you.